hearing about specific uh, mitigation measures, beginning with uh, shrubs. And we'll hear from Dr. Burgess uh, from Air Sciences Incorporated. <coughs> Okay, uh, all right, well, thanks, thanks everyone. Uh, we're kind of getting now to uh, kind of the meat of what we're all talking about today is, is, is two, kind of two new categories of uh, potential dust control. Um, I know I'm, like, I'm mostly going to be talking about uh, shrubland, and um, after me, John Bannister will be talking uh, about more about water control. Um, I, I work for Air Sciences, we're a contractor for, for EWP, and uh, we're out of Portland. Um, so just uh, John, John's presentation and my presentation were going to be a little longer than, than the other presentations, so just a quick outline. Um, I first want to do a little bit of background just as to wh uh, why the city is interested in pursuing shrubs specifically as a control measure. Um, then I kind of want to go into just uh, some literature. We'll talk kind of about some alien science fundamentals, about dry land environments. Uh, we'll also, so we'll talk about dust emission in general. We'll talk about um, specifically how vegetation controls dust emissions. Um, and then I want to talk about um, modeling uh, approaches. Uh, we're going to mostly focus on a model that was developed by one of our panelists, uh, Greg Oken. So uh, kind of we're thinking about using that as a potential uh, method to kind of guide us in, in this uh, uh, dust control approach. Um, so we'll kind of talk about the model. We'll talk about how we could possibly implement it in a real world, you know, applied situation. And then kind of the end, I kind of want to focus on a, on a, on a proposal for how we can move forward, what kind of uh, pilot study we could do to kind of test to see um, if a shrubland uh, dust control measure would work and, and what, what we need to do, do to make that work. Um, and, and kind of getting to what has been already covered, but I, the, the big thing to establish a dust control measure is, you know, we have to establish that shrubs um, are effective at controlling dust. We need some robust methodology to quantify the, the amount of reduction in PM10 emissions that we are getting with that control method. Um, so, that, you know, that's, that's the big challenge here, and a lot of your questions throughout the day, I think, of and pointing at exactly how do we estimate control efficiency. So um, coming up with a methodology to do that and then using that methodology to define criteria so we can look at an environment, look at a shrubland community and estimate what type of control um, we would expect to get. And that gets to another point that was said earlier is that there is a need to know how effective an area is at controlling dust when it is not windy. Um, so we need some method to do that when we don't actually have, um, well, yeah. Um, so uh, the, there's a lot of reasons why a sh shrubland as a dust control measure makes a lot of sense in Owens Lake. Um, uh, if you drive up Owens Valley, you'll see that shrubland is the dominant environment throughout the whole Owens Valley. Um, shrubs and shrubland in general stabilizes a lot of areas around the lake naturally if we're ready. Um, uh, and uh, they, they're also stabilizing a whole bunch of shoreline dune systems that surround the east side of the lake. Um, in particular, two species, peri saltbrush and greasewood, are two that are very common around the lake. And there's a paper back from the 90s from Dahlgren et al. That, that found that they're actually very tolerant, and not just a drought. And, and high saline environments, but just general conditions specific to the Owens Lake Playa. Um, and, and we've actually seen in some managed vegetation areas that were intended for soft grass, we've seen these species uh, sprout up um, just on their own. Um, and just lastly, uh, managed vegetation areas, which were initially initially I, you know, identified as soft grass communities, um, tend to be soft grass communities, they've been relatively successful, and this is kind of an extension of that idea. Um, here's just a couple uh, pictures of what these communities look like. This is a mature uh, greasewood uh, area on the northeast side of the lake. Oh, might be kind of hard to see. Um, this is a sparser greasewood community, and you can see you can see some uh, salt, salt grass in there as well. This is along the south side of the lake. And just for comparison, this is what's called a farm. This is one of the established managed vegetation areas uh, that's entirely modeled uh, saltgrass. 
can see the vegetation is much shorter. Um, it's, it's very extensive. Um, and obviously, sawgrass is a um, So the big reason why we're interested in, in looking at shrubs specifically over, or, or basically developing different methods for shrubs versus what is already established for managed vegetation is sawgrass is very different than shrubs in many somewhat obvious ways. Shrubs are taller. They are more porous. They are less pliable under high winds. Um, and they have different aspect ratios. And for all these things, all these reasons, um, literature tells us that the ways in which they control dust change compared to sawgrass. So, so we really need a different framework if we're going to use and, and quantify dust control um, in shrubland environments. Um, okay, so um, now just some general background on fundamentals of, of uh, dust emission. So if you guys are fully aware of this, I, I apologize. But um, uh, first thing is, is just kind of the getting at the mechanism what actually causes dust emission. Um, for perhaps what most people often assume and is, I think is the most logical way that PM10 emissions are emitted in dryland environments is, is what's called aerodynamic entrainment. And this is a process by which the, the uh, wind exerts aerodynamic drag on individual PM10 particles, and uh, this allows those particles to uh, eventually be entrained and suspended. Um, as it turns out, um, PM10 size particles are, they, basically there is very rare, or there's, there, the, the inner particle forces are strong enough that it's, it, it takes a, a very high wind speed to get the sufficient shear, shear stress to get get the PM10 to liberate PM10 size particles alone. Um, and so for that reason, aerodynamic entrainment is actually by far a very, very, very small driver of PM10 emissions in dryland environment. Um, two other mechanisms uh, dominate, and they have to do with the saltation of, of sand particles. So sand will start saltating at speeds, at, at friction velocities and, and wind speeds far lower than what you will get with the, with the PM10 size particle. Um, and so as those particles start to saltate, they absorb momentum from the air, and it's the, it's the impact of those larger sand grains with the ground surface that provides the energy to liberate the, the PM10 size particles. Um, and there's kind of now kind of two different dynamics that can happen. One is depicted here with saltating large sand grains. Um, another case is where you can have larger uh, aggregates of of a lot of PM10 particles, and the the, uh, the uh, impact will essentially break the aggregates. Um, and so, I'm trying to think about, yeah. Um, and and the other point of this that's very important is is that you know as uh, PM10 and also sulfating particles start moving, they absorb the momentum from the from the wind, um, and uh, and so this absorption of momentum is is a measure of essentially the amount of energy that's going into particle mobilization, and we we have an expression for that that's commonly referred to as a friction velocity or USAR. And uh, this this the so the the friction velocity or or the the downward flux of momentum is is, is physically manifested in the uh, in the vertical wind profile. So this is just kind of a depiction of this uh, wind speaking on the X. Um, the vertical wind profile off the surface. And so as we have a downward flux momentum through turbulence, we get a, a, a log, log, or logarithmic sorry, a wind profile um, on the surface. And so as the surface becomes rougher, um, we those large roughness, I guess what the big, big thing says, as, we, as the surface absorbs momentum that either goes into static roughness features like vegetation, rocks and also mobile particles. Um, and as we put larger roughness features on the surface, that absorbs more momentum. And and the, the, the critical piece of that is as we absorb or as, as as large roughness features absorb more momentum, that modifies the shape of the logarithmic wind profile and it effectively decreases the wind speeds at the ground surface and therefore decreases the amount of energy that's available right at the surface where all the particles are, so decreases the momentum going into particle mobilization. Um, 
Um, so there's so there's many models available to us to describe specifically how we relate um, a friction velocity to a horizontal flux of saltating sand and then the vertical flux of PM10 off the surface. Um, in general, most of these models end up being a third to fourth power relationship between uh, between U star or yeah uh, the third power of the friction velocity scales with with um, the saltation flux. Um, and I guess one thing I forgot to say is yeah uh, there's there's a term called the threshold velocity. So basically we have no saltation, no particle movement until we reach some specific friction velocity. Once we get to that, we have a third to fourth power increase in the saltation flux. Um, so a very rapid increase in the horizontal flux of saltating sand as, as, as the um, friction velocity increases. Um, as for PM10, generally um, it is often assumed that, uh, that, that uh, PM10 can scale with the horizontal sand flux and there's a lot of uh, things on Owens Lake that kind of build that assumption into, um, into all the regulatory um, decisions and you know we've seen a lot of talk today about sand flux and that's all kind of built on that, that assumption there. Um, and yeah, of course, there's, there's, so there's different models for both all these relationships, but these are just kind of the, that's the overall um, goal. So, so when we get to dust control mechanisms, the big thing here is that all of the mechanisms that have been tried, that have been attempted, they're all relying on this assumption that, that sand saltation is the main driver of PM10 emissions in dryland environments. And therefore, if we can shut down the, sand, the horizontal salt saving sand flux, we shut down the PM10 emissions. Um, and so there's kind of, in everything that we've talked about today, there's kind of three approaches to do this. Um, armoring has to do with, uh, sorry, armoring has to do with uh, increasing the cohesion of the particles or otherwise preventing their erosion when they uh, are hit by self hitting particles. Um, airflow modification has to do with introducing roughness features, creating more turbulence, and reducing that ground wind speed. Um, and then trapping is a different process that's just assuming, well, if we already have saltating particles, can we, can we provide low side for those moving particles to um, deposit either in, in divots and holes like in tillage um, or in the leaves of vegetation? Um, so, so as for vegetation, uh, there's, there's generally three methods of vegetation um, uses to reduce dust. This is a figure from an old paper, and I'm going to be showing a lot of pictures from this Wolfman Nickling paper. Uh, obviously, vegetation covers the surface. In those places, it's generally assumed that we don't get emissions. Um, uh, it extracts momentum from the air. This has to do with the same airflow modification that we've been talking about before. And then lastly, uh, vegetation can trap particles, and it can do it to some two ways. You can have vegetation actually hit or saltating particles actually hit the vegetation and stop, or in the lee of each vegetation element, we will have a wake, we'll have a region of slower moving air flow, and that is an opportunity for this, the saltation flux to decrease, and so we'll see deposition of saltating particles in vegetation lee. Um, and so a lot of what we know, and, and specifically a lot of the background for, for Dr. Oaken's model is really based on the characteristics of that, that wake or that region of slower moving air um, in the leaves of vegetation. So um, this is uh, just an old schematic, again, that has come out of the same Wolf and Nickling paper, just showing you generally what, what airflow looks like when it, when it flows around. Um, a shrub, you get slowing uh, upwind of the shrub. Uh, streamlines tend to uh, uh, converge around the tops and on the side. Um, you have this region of substantially reduced mean uh, wind speeds in the lee. Um, if the vegetation is very, or, sorry, if the vegetation is not very porous, you'll get, you'll get a recirculating eddy uh, kind of shown here. Um, but if the vegetation is, is, uh, is porous, you'll get bleed bleed flow through the vegetation. And uh, so you won't get a, an eddy as much there, but you'll get a little smaller eddies. <clears throat> and then um, eventually that slow moving air, the wake essentially is eroded both from the top and from the sides, and the wind speeds in that wake will re-equilibrate with, uh, with the upwind wind speeds over some distance. This figure isn't really to scale. We'll, we'll put more on that in a second. 
Um, so, so in dryland environments where where shrubs specifically are widely spaced, what as it turns out, the one of the most important factors is what is the spacing between these vegetation elements. So basically, to what extent are the vegetation elements protecting areas by leaving them in their leaves? Um, so um, this is yet another figure from this early Wolf and Nickling paper. Um, that has been republished multiple times, but they've generally classified dryland environments and dust emission into kind of three broad categories. Um, uh, on the top here is kind of the most emissive, sorry, category. Um, and this is a case where the spacing between the plants is such that the fast flow is able to return back to the surface um, at each wake. Basically, each wake is, a, is able to totally dissipate before, the, before we get to the next plant. Um, as you move to tighter spacing, they specify what's, there's a term called wake interface flow and then eventually skimming flow where this, in, you know, theoretically all of our ground surface is, is sheltered somewhat by slowed moving flow in the wake of some vegetation element um, upwind. Um, uh, I think that there's a, this is just a single figure from a cool paper, uh, Sutaburi et al. And just kind of is giving you a pictorial example of what these three regimes look like. So this is a wind tunnel study. Uh, these are clumps of real grass. And then on the floor here, they have um, the, the, this is all sand. Um, but they've colored sand white here and then red. And so what they've done is they've spun up this wind tunnel and, and looked at how that white sand uh, deposited in the leaves of, of the vegetation here. So this is a picture that's actually taken looking down in this red area after they run the wind tunnel. So in this most widely spaced case, you can see how um, the vegetation, or basically you can see white sand depositing in, in the leaves of each one of these grass elements. In this wider case, you can see how that the, the deposition mostly dissipates by the time it gets to the downwind plant. Um, in this case, you can start to see those areas of dep deposition you know, kind of start to connect a little bit and you can see, see those wakes um, connecting. And then once you get to this point, they basically saw no, no uh, I would, I'll say negligible sand motion at all. They had to identify individual grains that popped up, but more or less they had, they had completely shut down any motion by the time you get to there. So they, they're suggesting these are three uh, isolated roughness, interface skimming flow. Um, okay, so so uh, now getting into models. So the, the whole the whole idea why I'm I want to talk about models is I think given where things are in literature, we have a really great opportunity to use um, a, an ex existing models in a, an applied way for for estimating control efficiency um, on one plate. So. Um, one of the original, or the, the, the original approach to, to do this, um, uh, I won't call it, I'll, yeah, it's, it's called drag partitioning, and, the, and the, the logic for drag partitioning models is if we have, if we know our friction velocity, we can partition that friction velocity, we can partition that momentum into momentum that actually went into mobilizing particles and that which was absorbed due to turbulence from larger static roughness features. And if we can figure out what portion of that friction velocity actually went into um, into the into the particle mobilization, we can use one of those mass flux equations and estimate our our um, our emission rate. Um, uh, this type of approach, there's kind of two camps of how to do this, but in general, the models um, are really difficult to implement. They well, they they have issues. They don't necessarily agree with observations, especially when there's a lot of vegetation. Um, they they are difficult to implement practically. They don't they have trouble when vegetation gets tall. Um, a lot of them are, rely on uh, what's called either lateral cover or frontal area index, which is the it's, it's basically the the ratio, the cross sectional area of all the plants, um, yeah, divided by like the area that the plants reside on. Um, and this assumes that the plants are homogeneous, the spaced, um, which is not necessarily a good assumption. And so, anyway, I'll stop. I'll stop bashing this approach. <laughs> um, so, in, in 2008, Greg Open, who is uh, sitting with us, uh, introduced a, a different approach, and and this model is is 
uh, I think, much better for us <coughs> to implement in, in a way like this. So um, what, uh, what Dr. Oaken came up with is, is an idea that really kind of works off that third vegetation mechanism or the trapping um, mechanism that we talked about with vegetation. Um, the idea is that we will actually, well, we, we, we assume that we have, we have a model where we can explicitly place vegetation on, on a landscape surface, and we can say that we don't get vegetation, or we don't have emissions where the vegetation is, and then each vegetation element essentially reduces the overall um, saltation flux simply by reducing the wind speed in its own wake and therefore reducing the saltation flux specifically in, in each plant's own wake. So, okay, so um, just brief background on, on uh, Greg's uh, framework here. Um, uh, the, the model basically assumes that um, if we have a wind, or we, we can estimate, if we have a friction velocity, we can get that from a measured wind speed and a, an aerodynamic roughness length roughness length, sorry, um, we, can, we can drive a saltation flux using one of the mass flux equations that are available to us. So this isn't just an example of one. Um, if you remember, I was saying that in general, U star scales to the third, or sorry, the saltation flux Q scales to the third power of U star um, once U star is bigger than U star T. So we can, if, if we have a U star, we can estimate a saltation flux um, uh, for, for a given friction velocity, and this, right now we're just assuming no vegetation on the ground surface. Um, then, or, yeah, sorry, um, uh, to introduce vegetation, we can assume first no emissions occur where plants exist, and then we'll reduce um, U star specifically in the leaves of vegetation, and thus use the same equation to reduce the sand flux specifically in those spots in leaves of vegetation and we'll look at the integrated um, uh, effect on the saltation flux across the whole landscape. Um, so for this, for this approach to work, what we need is, is some model that describes how, uh, how an individual, individual plant element will decrease the wind speed of the shear velocity immediately in their own wake. So, um, this is an example that Greg Oaken presented in his paper. This data is from uh, a sand fan. Um, so on the X axis here, you're looking at the, the U star or the friction velocity in the wake of the plant normalized by the friction velocity um, in front of the plant. And this is in distance downwind of the, or sorry, I keep saying plant. In this case, it was sand fan, uh, distance downwind uh, in uh, meters divided by divided by scale by the the height of the fence. So here you can see immediately in the lee, wind or shear stresses drop by dropped about by you know they're 30% of what they were, and then this uh, returns back to back to normal within in this case 15 uh, uh, element heights or so. Um, so once we have if, if we have an equation for this, and the cool thing is we can basically fit an empirical function to any data that we have. Um, then we can then we can use this same mass flux equation and estimate a uh, a mass flux at any spot of a given x over h distance uh, from an upland plane. And so then, for us to get an estimate of what the overall saltation flux is on a landscape. All we need is a probability distribution of what or what are the odds that any one point on this landscape is a certain distance away from from the nearest upland plant. So um, we can we can prescribe this with a gamma distribution, for example, or we can use remote sensing and we can actually explicitly measure this for a real place. Um, and so, yeah, to get total flux, all we have to do is we can um, estimate the Horizontal mass flux for all x over h, and multiply that by the the uh, probability that that x over h exists on our landscape, and just integrate that across all of our x over h, and we get our total mass flux. Um, so, so with this approach, the, the uh, there's there's been several papers that have started to think about how can we um, 
you know, improve improve this approach and well, I guess understand more aspects of how the model uh, works. And so there's been a couple papers that have really started to hammer in um, what the shapes of these vegetation wakes look like. Um, there's been studies that have done both wind tunnel tests and field tests. This is a paper by Mayo et al. Um, <clears throat> instrumented uh, several uh, grass or uh, several individual grass elements and then two types of shrubs in the Kalahari Desert. And so they placed a line of anemometers uh, downwind of the plant and then looked at the, the decrease in the wind speed uh, over some period of, of time. So the blue here is showing you a decrease in the wind speed in the, in the, in the lee of each plant. And you can see that, that uh, there's a great deal of variability. Um, all the, the downwind distance here, again, is scaled by the plant height. But you can see there's a great deal of variability both in the amount of decrease in the wind speed and the immediately of the plant, and then also how far that wake extends back behind the plant. Um, this is just some graphs showing you the exact same data, just in a different form. So uh, now we're looking downwind distance, x over h, and then the y-axis is the normalized wind speed, or that's normalized by the, the upwind wind speed. So you can see um, similar graphs to what you're seeing with that previous plot, but immediately in the leaves of vegetation, we're getting somewhere around a 70% reduction in wind speed, and those return to normal. In these cases, they found for certain vegetation 10, generally papers are saying somewhere between 7 to 15 uh, plant element heights. Um, the cool thing from this mail paper is that they, they have started to get at, well, what are the, the properties of various plants that could be affecting uh, the shapes or the, the properties of these wakes. Um, so on the right here, we, uh, they, they found a, a linear relationship between the optical porosity and the, the amount of reduction in the, in the immediate wake of the plant. So basically saying the more porous, let me say it this way, the less porous the plant, the greater the reduction of wind speed in the immediate wake, um, which I think is pretty intuitive. Um, here, they, this is a less solid relationship, but there's something going on with the optical porosity. Basically, as the porosity increases, the um, speed at which the wake recovers is actually longer, and best hypotheses out there, at least in my understanding, is, is has to do with the size and the energy within the, the uh, turbulent eddies um, when you get changes in optical porosity. Um, this is a very similar example, but in a wind tunnel, they took a bunch of, uh, these, are, these are fake house plant or like plastic fake plants. Um, they did basically the same thing. So instrumented these plants in a wind tunnel uh, and uh, looked at uh, normalized wind speeds in the Lee, and they tried to identify similar types of things. So here they found a similar relationship between the plant porosity and the decrease in wind speed in the, in the, in the wake, or in the immediately. Um, this plot is showing you more or less the same thing. Here they kind of identified some other things that they are, I think they, yeah, there's, they fit, uh, one over X relationships to these, um, and this is relating the, the the aspect ratio of the plant to basically the, the speed at which it recovers. And their hypothesis here is that if you have a very tall, narrow plant, that erosion of the weight from the size will cause it to, to dissipate faster. Um, so so that so there's all of these. So these two papers, I think, are really interesting in, in shedding light on how these plant wakes work. Um, but one one thing that has been shown um, by Lee et al., and which is a paper that did a fairly thorough validation of the, the open framework overall, um, um, what this paper did was validate the open model against um, a large array 65 um, uh, sand catches, and we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, spread throughout the Western United States, and what they did was they they showed that the model really does a very good job, and we don't we don't even necessarily need to parameterize the wake properties of individual plants. That a very simple wake parameterization actually works very well. So 
So um, what this study did was uh, uh, collected, um, well, uh, there is a whole, a whole bunch of these BSNE sand catchers. So these are uh, instruments. We have one set up in the back of the room if you want to go check it out um, later. It's basically <clears throat> just a box with a hole in it. Um, so as sand saltates, it, it can bounce in that hole and collect, and you just go back at some later time and pick it up. Um, and they're on a wind vane, so theoretically they're always always facing into the wind. So um, for this study of the 65 sites, 13 were actually in Owens Valley. Um, for the Owens Valley case, they were observed for six months or so in 2009 in, in saltbrush, greasewood, and, and saltbrush community. So very appropriate for what we're talking about. Um, uh, they, because of the large differences in the magnitude of the sand flux they observed, they they to calculate error, they essentially took the log of all of their sand fluxes, got a root mean squared error of that, and then unlogged them. Um, so they define this method as a relative error. So, but but it's it's really quite remarkable that their uncertainties when they compare to actual observations are um, quite around 200 percent, which is very cool. And once they linearly scale that, uh, it gets even better, which is really really cool. So. Um, uh, yeah, and so and so this approach is this this paper has been really thorough, and I think when it comes to us about how do we develop this further, it would our general thought is kind of approximate what they've done in this paper, but do it kind of for a specific case in this for this application. Um, okay, so um, almost done here. So uh, again, so getting back to the the, the objectives that we want to do for some some work to kind of develop this idea. Um, uh, the the big the big point here is is to you know it's, it's quite clear that if we have a, a a very mature shrubland environment that we we can reduce emissions as much as as is needed but we do need a methodology that we can actually quantify that um, so uh, yeah. So yeah, we need we need a way to quantify control efficiency, and then we need a way to then um, define specific landscape parameters. Like we need vegetation of a certain spacing and certain height that uh, engineers at the city can use to to design their uh, how they're how they're going to implement that control strategy. Um, so so this is this is just kind of our idea of a proposal and the one thing we're we're really excited to hear from the whole panel is ideas on on what we could do um, to do this better um, but we're more or less following methods that we at all did just kind of with a more specific eye on how to implement this in a real world case so um, we've kind of identified uh, three different sites around the lake that have existing shrubland um, and a variety of covers from something that is more or less fully controlled, perhaps skimming, all the way to something that is um, a much more isolated shoveling environment. Uh, we want to instrument them with all that we'll need to, to force and, and, and run um, the OCA model with all the various parameterizations that we've kind of talked about and play with all those different mm -hmm. options. Um, so we'll play around with, or we'll, at each site we want to we want to have MET, a meteorological, um, sand flux observations, and uh, in addition to that, we'll want to measure plant gap spacing. I'll talk about that plant height and width, porosity, um, threshold velocity of the surface. Um, more specifics about just kind of our ideas here. Um, in, in addition to getting just one wind speed, we'd like to collect multiple heights so we can get an estimate of the, the roughness length. So we're thinking 642 and uh, top of vegetation with a tower similar to this, which we have implemented on the lake, or I'm not sure if on the lake, but elsewhere. Um, uh, we can measure sand flux either with BS and E's, um, as done with Lee et al. Our cock sand catchers um, uh, are another type of sand catch that uh, is less sophisticated. Um, and is used more widely on the wet lake, but um, perhaps not as thorough a measurement. We have examples of both those instruments back on the back table there. Um, uh, census have been talked about. These are also used on the lake. They allow us to get real-time um, data stream on 
on, part, on salt saving particles, we actually have a, a time resolved um, way to scale and see. We, we don't have a, they don't allow us to get an actual flux, but they can at least see relatively when we're seeing salt saving sand on the surface. Um, uh, we like to cr collect threshold velocity. That's widely done on the lake using a device called a pie swirl, and there's established me methods to get uh, plant velocity and corruption as well. Um, and as for the plant gap spacing, um, there's there's a whole bunch of papers that have developed remote sensing methods that we can use to estimate um, <clears throat> or, or me measure that plant gap spacing explicitly. Um, we can do that either with high resolution UAV imagery and uh, 3D structure using either structural motion or LIDAR. Um, and there are papers that have not only uh, developed methods to identify the individual plants, but then also build that plant gap distribution um, from that data set. So um, when we do this, we get a much better, rep you know, full representation of, of the, not just the spacing of plants, but their arrangement. Um, some of these papers have started to work on, can we actually get size or, or height properties from the vegetation as well? Um, so I guess probably obvious where I'm going to at this point, but my our, our, our thought is once we get all this data, we'll we will um, we'll be implementing the the, the OCM model as we as I've kind of described. I'm using metastation data, all the in situ data that I've talked about. Um, we'd like to kind of test the parameter space in a very thorough manner as, as done with Lee et al. Uh, and, and kind of play around with implementing different weight curves um, brought forth by all these different papers and just kind of see what gives us the best fits to our, to our uh, field data, to our, to our sand catch data. Um, one thing that hasn't been covered a lot in the literature is the effect that wind speed has on plant weights. It's known that as wind speeds increase, plants do become more streamlined, so their wakes do change. But there's probably also um, changes in the fluid dynamics and things like that. So we're uh, it, in a place like Owens Lake that it happens to be a lot windier than a lot of other uh, places in the West. That's that's one question that we're particularly interested in. Um, and then again, to validate this against sampling uh, observations. Um, and so then the idea is for implementing this is what, if if we can if we can calibrate this model appropriately, the idea would be that we can then um, play around with full parameter space. So define a whole bunch of different plant uh, gap distributions and different plant height distributions, throw those into the model and basically find out where our thresholds are um, to establish control efficiency. And in, in this case, to estimate control efficiency, what we have to do is we have to run the model with no plants at all. So assuming that everywhere that X of H is, is equivalent to infinity, um, so basically take out that part of the model and use that as our denominator when, when calculating a control efficiency. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, so conclusions. Um, uh, w once, we, once we go through this approach to, uh, you know, to identify what characteristics are needed of a specific Plant community. Um, th th this is this gives us the information to. Uh, this this gives PDOP the information they need to determine if that is a feasible thing. And I think the point I'm trying to say here is that that I haven't talked at all about how one would actually go about introducing shrubs in a specific environment. And I, the reason why I'm not getting into that is that is a very location specific question. Um, and if we are to get into that, the first question is. What type of shrubland do we need? What are the characteristics? Do we need fully mature shrubs? How many, how dense do they need to be? Once we establish that question, that's when we can give that information to engineers and they can they can evaluate whether that's feasible for any one specific spot. Um, so our hope from all of the panel is is that uh, that you guys can evaluate these ideas and we're really looking forward to any feedback that you guys can provide. Um, of course, if this is successful and we're able to push forward with this, with this study, the idea is that we could this would form the basis for a vacuum application uh, to the district in the future. 
Um, and, and lastly, if there's any aspect of this talk that uh, was too brief or, or, I, or you didn't pick up on, we are going to be distributing our report within a week or so that basically covers everything that I talked about. So if, if there's any other questions uh, that might fill in for you in or I'll be available after the next talk too. So yeah, thanks. Thank you. Uh, so uh, to keep on schedule, let's move rapidly on to the next talk, which is also from Air Sciences. Uh, John Bannister, uh, tell us about shallow flooding wetness cover refinement <clears throat> test. All right, hello. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to present. Uh, as I said, my name is John Bannister. I'm also with Air Sciences, uh, Science Consultant with LADWP. Um, appreciate the opportunity to present, and thank you to everyone who's spoken before. I think they've done a good job of kind of foreshadowing a lot of what I'm going to talk about. There's been a lot of talk about shallow flood, control efficiency, water use on the lake, and that's all related to what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to talk about the shallow flood wetness curve refinement field test and also related soil moisture effects on dust control. Uh, my intention here is to just kind of give a broad overview of shallow flood control efficiency on the lake, what's been done in the past, and what we'd like to do going forward. Um, as with Evan, uh, we're going to be providing a full report uh, with studies that have been cited, literature that's been cited, and a detailed study plan uh, after the meeting. So I'm not going to go too much into detail here, but if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer as you know. I'm going to give a quick background of shallow flood on the lake. Uh, I promise not to tread too much on ground that's already been covered. Then talk about the shallow flood wet curve refinement fuel test, probably the worst name study. <laughs> uh, the work acronym uh, that was conducted in 2013-2016. Then from there, talk about soil moisture in shallow flood areas in general and how that might be investigated further. And then finally get into a brief overview of a proposed field study that we'd like to implement going forward. So the objectives of this field study are going to be twofold. Uh, number one is to perform the wetness curve refinement field test as is allowed in the SIP. Uh, the purpose of this test, which I'll get into in more detail, is to refine the control efficiency curve used to establish required wetness covers for shallow flood areas. Um, and to achieve, basically the point of this test is to observe various saturated wetness coverages and determine control efficiency achieved under those variable wetness coverages. Related to that, um, and this stems from observations we've made in previous studies, is to perform a separate but concurrent study on the effects of soil moisture for dust control on Owens Lake. Um, if possible, establish methods to reliably characterize soil moisture over a large dust control area, and then relate those spatial temporal patterns of soil moisture to a sandflux control efficiency. So shallow flooding has been talked about a bit already. Uh, it's by far the most widely used dust control measure on Owen Lake, <clears throat> with about 60% of the control playa, uh, right around 30 square miles, currently under some form of shallow flood dust control, and that can be ponds, sprinklers, or lateral overland flow. Uh, Arash said earlier that I think the last year the lake used something like 60,000 acre feet of water per year. Um, I, all of that water was used in maintaining shallow flood areas, basically. Uh, when you consider that, I think the city of Los Angeles annual water demand is something like 500,000 acre feet per year. So Owens Lake, the equivalent of 12% of the water demand for Los Angeles is used in Owens Lake shallow flood. So that's just to give some perspective on how important it is, you know, given the state of water in the Western US and how we think that's going to change in the future, uh, how important it is to make sure that shallow flood areas in Owens Lake are being operated as efficiently as possible, right? Um, there's no need or no benefit to using more water than, well, for dust control reasons, 
there's no need to use more water than is necessary as long as the requirements for dust control are met, right? There's other uh, other things to consider, but for this talk, I'm just going to be strictly talking about dust control. Uh, shallow flood dust control, you know, in a nutshell, just applies sufficient water across an area to reduce PM10 emissions below target levels. So some key terms that I'll go through briefly uh, that you've heard before. Sand flux is just a horizontal particle motion across the ply surface. Um, as has been mentioned, studies have shown that on Owens Lake, the vertical PM10 flux off of an area is proportional to the horizontal sand flux in that area. So because of that relationship, it makes sense to use horizontal sand flux as an index for vertical PM10 emissions off of an area because you can instrument an area specifically, measure the sand flux in that area, and to get an idea of how much PM10 that particular area might be producing. Uh, the sand flux is measured, it's recorded in units of mass per area over time, so for instance, grams per centimeter squared per hour, <clears throat> and on the lake it's typically measured by a time result combination from Cox sand catches for the sand mass and then census or particle hits over time. Control efficiency is the relative reduction in PM10 emissions uh, resulting from a dust control measure. With that relationship of sand flux to PM10, uh, control efficiency is often calculated by a reduction in sand flux in an area. Uh, in particular, for shallow flood areas, the control efficiency is simply one minus the ratio of sand flux in the control area over some reference sand flux. And we'll get into where those reference sand fluxes might come from here in a second. And then wetness cover is defined in the SIP as the percentage of an area that is substantially evenly distributed standing water or surface saturated soil. <clears throat> so that's a key <clears throat> clause right there. Um, it has to be standing water or surface saturated soil. Soils with less water than that, moist soils or damp soils, uh, are not considered control. Uh, for compliance purposes in shallow flood areas, only saturated or standing water. So typically the wetness cover estimates for Owens Lake shallow flood areas have been done by the analysis of remote sensing images. Uh, the types of images and analysis methods have changed over time uh, as technology changes uh, or for the particular application that's being done. So two obvious ones, aircraft, uh, initially, and then more recently, satellites, specifically Landsat satellites, and then visible spectrum has been used to determine wetness cover, and now the standard we use is shortwave infrared spectrum, so band six in Landsat eight, I believe. Uh, might be five, one of them. So, an overview of shallow flood as of now on the lake. Uh, the shallow flood areas can kind of be put in two broad categories. The first category is the original 2003 dust control areas that comprise just under 20 square miles of the lake. They have a target control efficiency, so they need to meet a control efficiency of 99%. And to meet that, the requirement is they have 75% saturated or standing water wet cover. The second area, smaller, just, on, just over nine square miles, are the 2006 supplemental dust control areas. Those, again, have a target control efficiency of 99% but they are only required to meet 72% wetness cover. And I'll get to the difference there in a second. Uh, the supplemental dust control area includes a very small portion that are uh, reduced compliance efficiency areas. So areas that need to be flooded to a level to achieve a control efficiency less than 99%, it varies. So how were these wetness covers determined? <clears throat> uh, the 2003 dust control areas, the original shallow flood dust control areas, uh, Dr. Holder mentioned previously the flood irrigation project. Uh, what I'll be talking about here, I'm actually not aware of the results of the south flood irrigation project. I'll be talking about the north flood irrigation project. Um, and those results lead directly to the current shallow flood control efficiency code. So in the north flood irrigation project, uh, the control efficiency was calculated by comparing area average sand fluxes in dry areas compared to adjacent wet areas. Uh, the wetness cover was measured by the manual analysis and digitization of visible spectrum aerial photographs. 
the study was conducted in the northeast portion of the Owens Lake Playa, that north sand sheet uh, that was mentioned earlier. Uh, the study was performed between approximately 1993 and 1995, I believe. The data points that were used to develop the control efficiency curve here uh, came from six high wind events, all in 1994. So for these wind events, uh, the control efficiency in the dry area was compared to control efficiency in the wetted area. The observed wetness cover in the wet area was determined using the aerial photograph. And these data points were plotted, percent wet cover to control efficiency. And then this curve was developed uh, relating wetness cover to control efficiency for shallow flood areas. For the 2006, Supplemental dust control areas, uh, 2016 SIP, I believe it first appeared in 2008 SIP. So, uh, instead of just saying they need 99% control at 75% wetness cover, these areas were allowed to achieve a target control efficiency at a wetness cover determined by what became known as the shallow flood control efficiency curve. This red line right here that appears in the SIP. Uh, this red line, the shallow control efficiency curve, was developed by connecting a subset of the data points that were developed in the North SIP study. So this curve then determined for the 2006 supplemental dust control areas what required wetness cover is necessary. The vast majority of that area requires 99% control efficiency, which turns out to be 72% wetness cover. In 2008, so there was a question, you know, as the lake changes, are these wetness covers as efficient as they can be, as they optimize? Uh, LEDWP was curious about that, commissioned air sciences to perform uh, a retrospective analysis of operating shallow flood areas in 2008. Uh, this was done by looking at areas that were under current shallow flood operation, uh, taking control efficiencies in those areas by measured sand flux, Comparing that measured sand flux to available historical values that were measured in those areas pre-construction, before dust control measures had gone in. Uh, then looking at the wetness cover that was observed in those areas during normal compliance overflights, uh, landside overflights, and just taking the calculated control efficiency, comparing it to the observed wetness cover, and seeing where we land. So this data I'm presenting here. This full report will be provided in the technical packet. Uh, these graphs represent screen data uh, based on uh, the, basically the uh, quality of the shallow flood areas, areas with uh, highly separated wet and dry areas with large dry fetches were determined to not be representative maybe, or areas with a lot of managed vegetation, or sorry, not managed vegetation, a lot of natural vegetation uh, were excluded from this analysis. <laughs> so the full data set will be available in the report. But, Regardless, not being conclusive, it's definitely interesting. You know, there's a lot of high control efficiencies at wetness covers that are below the required 75% or 72%. So if nothing else has indicated that this is something worth studying further. In the 2006 settlement agreement that was then uh, you know, carried into the 2008-2016 SIP, there was an allowance that the city will have the option to conduct field testing to refine the wetness cover requirements to achieve 99% control efficiency in shallow flood areas. So this clause in the settlement agreement is the basis for conducting the shallow flood wetness curve refinement test, that the city has the right to do a field study to see if that curve can be refined. So the first design study to utilize this clause uh, was performed in 2015-16, the curve refinement study. Uh, as I said, it was the first design study versus a just basically taking naturally operated areas and evaluating those. And the study plan was developed uh, in collaboration between DWP and Great Basin, with the intent being that the study layout would, as well as possible, kind of follow the concept used in the FIT study, having a untreated dry area adjacent to treatment areas. Uh, the difference being that these treatment areas, instead of just being measured what they naturally occurred at, they were designed to hopefully achieve various wetness covers 
Uh, sand flux was measured under natural wind events, obviously. So over the course of the dust season, sand flux is monitored continuously along with MET data. And the wetness cover estimates were performed by high resolution sphere imaging uh, for a reason I'll get into shortly. Uh, this is showing T26. Um, the area of probably the best data that came out of this or the most um, complete data. But the study also included areas of T29, T10, and T13. I know, I mean, just background, uh, the dust control areas are all named T number, right? Uh, Jen mentioned earlier that the main line has turnouts, 35 turnouts. So the number that associates with the dust control area is kind of the nearest main line turnout. And a rule of thumb is lower numbers tend to be towards the south. And as you go up around the east side of the lake, they get higher. So T26 is kind of in the northeast portion of the lake. Not adjacent to, but in the general area that the north of the study uh, occurred. So the preliminary results from this study are shown here. Again, we had a lot of high control efficiencies uh, for wetness covers that were much lower than the 75% originally uh, required. Uh, the data in this plot was filtered um, specifically for this presentation to kind of uh, be analogous to the type of wind events that were observed in the North Fifth study. Uh, so wind events with continuous hours greater than 21 miles per hour. Uh, although I just showed the preliminary results, I don't want to gloss over the fact that this study had a lot of challenges. Uh, as a first design study for this, there were a lot of what we call lessons learned, right? So some of the problems that came up, uh, number one, I would say, was wetness cover in the study areas. And the issues involved with wetness cover, um, I think, are twofold. Uh, there were challenges in operating these areas to these specific wetness covers that were lower than typical shallow flood wetness covers, right? And not only were they lower than typical shallow flood wetness covers, but we were attempting to hit wetness covers exactly. Um, in a traditional shallow flood area, the area can be oversaturated, right? You can allow water to run off, and as long as you're over the 75% compliance limit, that's great. No one, that's wonderful. Um, in this, if we ran every area higher than normal, we'd have a bunch of high wetness covers. They would probably have great control efficiencies, but wouldn't give us really any information that we didn't already have. So attempting to run these areas at very exact lower wetness covers was a challenge. Um, besides the operating challenges, I think there are also challenges in estimating wetness cover in these areas uh, related to a few things. The size of the wet feature in these areas, being sprinkler irrigated areas, the drying cycles that were observed in these areas, <clears throat> and finally, the presence of transition areas or transition wetness areas going from wet to dry. And then second, uh, the question came up of control efficiency calculations and how do low sand fluxes in the untreated area affect your final control efficiency calculations, right? So first I'll touch on the challenges with wetness cover. And I'll do a brief digression here on how shallow, uh, shortwave infrared is used to estimate wetness in shallow flood areas. Uh, areas with standing or saturated water uh, absorb light in the shortwave infrared spectrum. So the compliance measure for Owens Lake is to use shortwave infrared images, uh, look at the reflectance of those images, and then determine wet and dry areas based on the shortwave infrared reflectance. Uh, you can see here just an example. Here's two concurrently taken images, one in the visible spectrum, one in the shortwave infrared. These highlighted areas in the visible spectrum, at least to my eye, look pretty similar to everything around them, right? But when you look at it in the shortwave infrared, you can see these dark areas pop up showing high absorption of shortwave infrared presence of water. The way that wetness cover is determined using shortwave infrared for shallow flood currently is using what's known uh, colloquially as a teeter point, uh, which is simply just another way of threshold value, right? A threshold reflectance value is determined pixels in the image which have less reflectance than the teeter point are wet, considered wet. Areas with more reflectance than the teeter point are considered dry, 
Um, this is something that's been used, uh, methods been used, I think, um, at least as long as I've been involved in with like on shallow flow compliance. Uh, every shore wave infrared sensor that's used for compliance measurement, uh, a teeter point is developed for that sensor. The most recent one, the Landsat 8 OLI sensor, uh, the teeter point was developed uh, by Kenneth McGuire at the Desert Research Institute uh, in a study for the district. So, using this method of basically a binary classification of every pixel in the image is either wet or dry, right? We get into the resolution of the image and how that's affected by the feature size you're trying to measure, right? So Landsat has about a 30 meter pixel, so 30 meters on a side, and it gives you one square reflectance value for that pixel. Uh, the sprinklers in these areas that were used for wetting have uh, a throw radius of about 10 meters. So they're relatively small compared to Landsat pixels, especially if we consider that entire throw radius of the sprinkler is not going to be evenly saturated water and everything outside it perfectly dry, right? There's going to be a very wet area in the center and maybe around the edges and uh, it's a complex uh, lay of the ground. So if you look at two concurrently taken images, oh, sorry, I guess I should say, for this study, because there were these concerns about the size of the Landsat pixel compared to the wetness features, uh, it was decided to use a plane-based SWEAR sensor uh, that was flown by a company called Spectier out of Reno, Nevada. They're able to fly over the lake and provide us with shortwave infrared images uh, of about a four meter pixel size. Uh, there were calibrations done to make sure that Spectier's images uh, would be comparable to Landsat images, calibrations on known areas, um, so we can compare them one-to-one. -one. Uh, here is, we didn't always do this, do a concurrent flyover, but in this case, you know, to illustrate this point or to investigate this point, uh, we had the SWEAR, I'm uh, sorry, the SPECTIR plane fly over the area. At the same time, we knew the Landsat was acquiring an image. To take two concurrent images of the same area, compare what we get from those two images. Landsat with their 30 meter pixel estimated this area, this highlighted area here, to be 29% wet. The plane-based image this here was estimated at 47% wet. And when you zoom in, you can see the difference. Uh, Landsat obviously is not picking up some of the wetness in here just by the average over that 30 meter pixel, the average reflectance is gonna come in at a point higher than the Swear teeter point, classifying that area as dry. Whereas with smaller pixel, you have much finer resolution, you can differentiate between the pixels and classify wet areas uh, much more finely. The second problem uh, or challenge that we had uh, in this study was the dynamic nature of these areas. Uh, we suspected that these areas were going through wetting and drying cycles more so than traditional shallow flood areas for that reason I mentioned earlier. Sprinkler shallow flood areas that are in normal uh, shallow flood compliance are typically overwetted, have a lot more standing water, have a lot more surface runoff, whereas these areas we're trying to hit exactly, not overwet them at all. And when you do that, you end up with a lot more transition area, not saturated, not dry, and that area tends to dry out quicker. So here's three images to investigate this effect. We had Spectre fly over uh, the lake one flight after another uh, in June of 2016. The first flight occurred immediately after the sprinklers were shut off in the area. Uh, after about an hour and a half, the next flight. So the wetness analysis goes from 51% wet right after the sprinklers were shut down to just 20% wet an hour and a half later to 15% three hours later. So with this kind of dynamic drying effect, you can imagine when you're relying on a snapshot image to estimate wetness in an area, when you've got this dynamic wet dry, the wetness estimate you get is going to be highly dependent on when you took that image. And no matter how much you try to take the image at the same point or at the same point of the day or calibrate the sprinklers, uh, there's always going to be some uncertainty on where you're hitting on this curve. So for the study, the sprinklers were typically operated in two or three separate one hour sets during daylight hours. And as I mentioned, you know, these challenges, feature resolution, the drying cycles, they were exacerbated 
in this study, we believe, because we're trying to hit these exact wetnesses. So these aren't necessarily problems you'd see in sprinkler shallow flood areas that are under normal compliance, but it did occur in this study. So as you can imagine, uh, with these challenges I've just outlined, uh, the wetness cover estimates we got in these study areas were highly variable. Uh, a single monthly swear image was used to track wetness coverage. That decision was made based on the assumption and previous experience that shallow flood areas had been fairly stable over time. They didn't go through these wetting and drying areas, or sorry, wetting and drying cycles. Uh, that obviously proved to not be the case, and a month in retrospect was uh, far, far too long between uh, wet assessments. But that's what we had. So the single monthly swear image was used to track the wetness coverage, and then when a wind event occurred, the wetness coverage for that wind event is assigned according to the nearest swear wetness estimate. So if a swear image was taken one day, and then nine days later, a wind event occurred, the wetness coverage that is assigned to that wind event in calculating control efficiency to wetness coverage was taken from that swear image nine days earlier. Not ideal, right? The second uh, point I mentioned in regards to control efficiency calculations and control, uh, sorry, standard flux in the untreated areas. Uh, I just wanted to illustrate here, I don't think anyone needs me to do the math, but I just want to drive home the obvious point that the calculated control efficiency is not simply determined by the sand flux in your controlled area, your treatment area, but also by the sand flux you see naturally in your reference area. So, you know, sand fluxes that remain the same in the controlled area under a wind event, um, depending on what kind of reference sand flux you get, what kind of sand flux you see in the untreated area, your control efficiencies can vary greatly. Uh, especially when you get to very low natural sand fluxes in your untreated area. Uh, a very low natural sand flux in your untreated area, you could have an even lower sand flux in your treated areas, but still come up with a control efficiency that's bad, frankly. Uh, to give kind of an example, uh, in the North Fifth study, for the events that they used to calculate the original shallow flood control efficiency curve, the reference sand fluxes, so the sand fluxes they saw in their dry areas, uh, over the area averaged about 16.1 grams per centimeter squared per hour during their events. The sand fluxes we saw during the wind events, during the shallow flood control uh, curve refinement study, averaged 9.4. And most importantly, when you look at these two distributions here, there was a large number of low sand fluxes uh, in the untreated area during the curve refinement phase. So given all that, uh, I still think it's important to remember that even with all these challenges, there were still high control efficiencies observed at low wetness covers. Um, again, not conclusive proof that this is too high, but definitely an indication that there's something there that bears investigation, right? Uh, especially when you consider what I just mentioned about control efficiency and sand flux in the untreated area, these very low control efficiencies, every control efficiency under 90% that was observed is associated with a very low sand flux in the untreated area. So for whatever reason, the untreated dry area was not blowing as much as we would expect. It had a low sand flux for some of these events. And as a result, we can have a very low sand flux in the treated areas and get low control efficiencies. So the final part that I haven't gotten to yet because I think it bears a little bit deeper dive is the wetness transition areas. Um, in these steady areas uh, with these you know, targeted wetnesses, wetness covers, uh, there was a lot of ground that couldn't be classified as saturated, but also probably couldn't be classified as dry. You'd either have very wet soil underneath a uh, very thin dry crust, or you know, large areas that don't pass the saturated test. Um, the field test for saturated soil used on like something called a tap test. Um, it's basically going out, tapping with a staff or your shoe. You see free water come up, that's considered saturated. Um, so obviously a lot of these areas would not see free water under that test, but uh, 
definitely you wouldn't classify these as dry. So how these areas, how much of these areas there are, how they affect control positions, that's all a question I think bears further investigation. And you know, understanding these effects is going to lead to a greater understanding of uh, how shallow flood areas control that, right? Especially sprinkling shallow flood areas. So that's just a field test to kind of begin investigating how prevalent these areas were. Uh, we performed, we had field crews walk, or it's probably not the best, you can't really see, but there's lines here that represent lateral transects that field crews walked while a swear image was being taken. And when the crew was walking these transects, they would be recording how much of the area they recorded as dry, how much they recorded as moist or damp, and how much they recorded as saturated. The SWEAR image was going over at the same time, and then we just performed the teeter point wet dry analysis along the same transect in the SWEAR image. Uh, here's the results for each transect of each bar. The blue here represents the portion of that transect that was recorded by the field crew as saturated ground. The green represents the proportion of that transect that was recorded as transition or moist ground. And then the red line there is the wetness cover determined along that transect by the SWEAR wet dry to point analysis. So, you know, it's, the results are interesting, right? Uh, these, all of these transects have a large proportion of transition area, moist ground or damp ground. Uh, the SWEAR, in some cases, didn't pick up very much at all of that transition ground. In some cases, picked up quite a bit of it. In some cases, it's unclear. Um, so I think the interplay between how does moist soil control dust or help control dust or sand flux, how does our estimating methods deal with these areas, how does it see them, does it see them, uh, it's all, I think, goes into better understanding how these areas are working. And without kind of understanding these issues, I think we're working um, kind of with blinders on when it comes to really getting a handle on what's going on in some of these shallow flood areas. So really briefly, I said it would be high level, but <clears throat> moist soil and how does that contribute to dust control, right, in theory. Uh, here's the, the dust control and mechanics of N diagram. Uh, in this diagram, soil moisture falls solidly within the armoring, armoring section. Uh, it prevents particle motion initiation, but it doesn't provide any trapping, you know, that you would see with ponding, for instance. It doesn't modify the airflow. So, in general, you know, the presence of soil moisture less than saturated is going to increase the cohesion in soil due to the surface tension uh, in the water between the particles, which in turn increases the erosion threshold friction wind velocity, which then obviously reduces sand motion and saltation. So this is not a new concept, right? I think this is well established that this mechanism occurs. Um, but a question is, is, does this apply to Owens Lake? You know, Owens Lake is a unique place. The soils are unique. Um, is this something that's going to, you know, hold in the, the environment we're working in? Uh, to try to answer that question, or, or at least approach the answer to that question, LADWP commissioned a study, a wind tunnel study, uh, to look at this in a more controlled environment. Uh, this study was conducted at the Trent University, uh, Trent Environmental Wind Tunnel uh, in Peterborough, Trent University, Peterborough, Ontario, Canada. Uh, this facility was chosen. This is probably the premier uh, Aeolian science wind tunnel in North America. It's uh, you know, completely environmentally controlled. Um, they have a lot of experience doing particle motion and erosion studies. The premise of this study was that Owens Lake soil from Owens Lake, uh, from T26, as a matter of fact, as, as well as other areas, was collected, uh, shipped up to Canada. They took this soil. Uh, the premise was they would put it to a certain moisture content, put it in a wind tunnel, fully instrumented for PM10 emissions, saltation, particle motion, uh, and then run it under varying wind speeds and varying environmental conditions to see what happens as far as particle motion goes. Uh, the test cycles 
were as follows. Uh, the material was put in the wind tunnel. It was then subjected to four different test cycles, a test cycle cons consisting of three five-minute wind intervals of increasing speed. So five minutes under six meters per second wind, five minutes under nine meters, and then five minutes under 13.5, repeated, then allowed to dry for 12 hours in the tunnel under wind, then those two cycles, or those cycles repeated two more times. And during all this time, the soil was wetted initially uh, to variable moisture contents, and then throughout this entire process, just allowed to dry naturally, not disturbed until the final cycle, uh, because during these three cycles, you know, obviously drying occurs and a crust forms on the top of the soil. This fourth cycle, that crust was broken up uh, by, they tried various methods. Uh, the best one I think ends up being a board hit with a hammer, fracturing the surface. So the results of this study, first we wanted to get an idea of how emissive these soils were. Make sure that, you know, we're going to see the kind of emissions you would expect. Uh, we know these soils are emissive. Let's make sure that's happening in the wind tunnel. So the soil was dry to a very low moisture content and then completely pulverized. It was placed in the wind tunnel and in a single test cycle of ramped wind speeds uh, was executed. First five meters per second, six, nine, and 13. Uh, this, the y-axis here is the cumulative particle count. This is, uh, that's 10 to the fourth there. So as you would expect, you know, as the wind speeds increased, the particle counts increased until at 13 meters per second, the reason this line uh, cuts off is because the instrument saturated. So incredibly emissive. Um, the lab team was not happy, like <laughs> a big mess. But uh, at least, you know, we proved that these soils, they're emissive as we did that. So then the testing cycles were done. And here I'm providing an example. Uh, multiple cycles were done on different soils at different starting moisture contents under different relative humidities. Uh, but as an example, here is a test executed on the same soil that was done for this test. These dotted lines here give you an idea of the scale of this plot compared to this one. Uh, and as you can see, this here, this number is five. So we had single digit particle counts uh, coming off of the soil through three cycles. Then any crust that had been formed was broken, and uh, the highest number here is 10. So, you know, orders of magnitude lower, uh, even after extensive drying, right? So, again, another indication that these moist soils are providing control in excess of what they're being given credit for. So, to bring all this together, uh, and get towards the wrap up here. Uh, we're proposing a new field study, uh, similar in some ways to the original shallow flood wetness curve refinement field test, um, with the intention of still fulfilling that purpose of, of refining that shallow flood control efficiency curve, right? With the addition of adding in additional methods and instrumentation to also investigate the extent and effect of moist soil in these areas. So, the study was proposing, and again, this will a uh, detailed study plan will be provided. This is just a real high level overview. Uh, this study will again be conducted in T26. Uh, it's about 160 acres, this area here, under a control, under, untreated, you know, dry area, and then a 40% target moisture con or sorry, wetness cover and then a 60% target wetness cover. The rest of T26 will continue to be operated as a shallow flood area, 75% control. Uh, the area will be surrounded by PM10 monitors, MET stations, video cameras, uh, sorry, well, still cameras at you know, five minute intervals. Um, the district has understandable concerns. Uh, this is Keeler right here, uh, the populated area. The district has concerns about you know, possible PM10 emissions from this dry area reaching Keeler, so you know, the purpose of these is to make sure and track as best we can uh, what is actually coming off this area, if this area is contributing to PM10 at the shoreline. Uh, here's a close-up of kind of a preliminary uh, layout of the steady areas. Um, we've got the control area, these red lines, if you can see them, 
are sand fencing uh, to prevent sand motion from the control area if there is any into the steady areas to kind of block that off. Uh, the areas are going to be aligned with the predominant north-south winds uh, that are present in this area. The target uh, wetness covers are again going to be a system of sprinklers left capped and opened in a pattern to achieve the target wetness covers. Um, we think, and I'll get into it in a second, uh, with improved operations and monitoring, we can do a better job of hitting those target wetness covers and keeping them there. And then an extensive monitoring network for sand flux and now soil moisture content and you know, water application through uh, flow meters on the sprinkler lateral line. So I'd like to talk a little bit because I think the biggest challenge in the first study and one we'd like to do our best to address is wetness control in these areas. Uh, we're still shooting for that target wetness without shooting too far over or letting it drop too, down, too far down. So, you know, there's still going to be some dynamic effect in these areas. That's inevitable. But hopefully it can be minimized or tracked better. Uh, some operational adjustments. Um, now this area is, <coughs> it either is or will be soon on uh, SCADA control, which will allow for better tracking and better control of the sprinkler on off schedule, uh, possibly allowing for fewer shorter sprinkler sets instead of those long ones and with prolonged drying in between, maybe hit more shorter sets to keep it more consistent. Right? And then a uh, water balance model for T26 has been developed uh, mostly just for operational use for tracking changes in uh, evaporation, natural, natural precipitation, and then calibrated with monitoring results to give them an idea of how operational changes are affecting the wetness cover in the area. And second, developing monitoring <coughs> methods that we hope can combine remote sensing uh, with some in-situ soil moisture sensors with a goal of providing an estimated ground condition whenever a wind event might occur. Uh, regardless of how we uh, sense these areas, when you're only using remote sensing, you're always going to have a limit on how many images you can take. You can't have a satellite over there all the time taking images. So unfortunately, I wish you could. But those wind events are going to occur whenever they're going to occur. Uh, we want to, as best we can, at least estimate the conditions on the ground when a wind event occurs, not have to rely on an image that was taken days or a week beforehand. So first, the in-situ soil moisture sensors. Uh, there is a concern on Owens Lake that's always brought up with soil moisture sensors, the salinity of the soil, right? And how well or can these instruments work in soil that's this salty? Um, we've been doing some testing in the lab and in the field on, uh, this is a 5T uh, soil moisture sensor that uh, my colleague has been working on and can answer questions on, but there's been uh, lab calibrations done for soil from T26 and then field testing in T26 uh, that shows even in these soils with their salinity, you can develop calibration curves and you can see changes in gravimetric water content via soil conductivity in these areas. So, you know, there's still more work to be done to prove out these methods, uh, but I think they're, they're promising and you know, we're confident that there will be a way to make this work. Uh, SWIR imaging obviously is going to still be a big part of the study because we want to uh, meet those requirements of the shallow flood curve refinement study. Uh, but in addition to doing the teeter point wet dry analysis, uh, we'd like to expand the investigation into the continuous SWIR value. And whether there's information to be gained by looking not just at whether the square reflectance falls on either side of a single value, but looking at the value as a continuum. And will that give us some insight maybe into these transition areas, right? Especially in conjunction with in-place soil moisture sensors that tell us what moisture the soil is at the time. Uh, and then finally, another promising aspect we think is synthetic aperture radar uh, or SAR. Uh, SAR images are available from a Sentinel-1 satellite platform. Uh, they occur about two times a week. Uh, SAR has been 
investigated already as a method for main, uh, measuring soil moisture. I can detect soil moisture under the surface, about two to three centimeters. Uh, day or night acquisition. Sentinel provides an 18 meter resolution image. So these methods, uh, we hope, and again, this is a concept we're working with, and one of the reasons we're bringing it here is uh, we appreciate input on how you know this method can be refined or improved. But you know we want to combine these soil moisture content sensors that provide a continuous measure on the ground at any time, combine those with remote sensing imagery to develop a model that can tell us you know, given the instantaneous soil moisture content of the sensors, what's the condition on the ground, right? So in general, you know, the concept would be to identify reference points on the remote sensing images where the changes in the reflectance values of those points correlate to general shifts in the image reflectance. Install a network of soil moisture content sensors across the steady areas of these reference points, and then develop a relationship between sensor moisture content and image reflectance, and then develop a model relating sensor moisture content to an image reflectance profile. So, when no image is available, you can kind of estimate what the soil profile might be based on the values you're getting from your in place soil moisture sensors. In high concept, right? If we've got a soil moisture content sensor here, let's say it's got some area of influence that we're going to define around it, right? When we have an image, we have a soil moisture content that can then be related to an anticipated reflectance value at that point based on analysis of previous images. So we've got a, a sensor reflectance, right? It relates somewhere to the distribution of reflectances observed in this area of influence. Over the course of many images, we can determine that this distribution of SWIR reflectance in this area, or SAR reflectance, I use the same SWIR, but it could be SAR, uh, remains pretty similar from image to image. Perhaps you know, an offset in the sensor image, or sorry, in the sensor reflectance could indicate an offset in the distribution of square reflectances or star reflectances around that sensor. Like I said, it's in general, the direction we're moving, uh, and input on how to best achieve this is well appreciated. So you know, what we're requesting, and again, I appreciate you all taking the time. Um, you know, this has been a challenging study, but I think it's an interesting one. I think it's important. And overall, we're looking for a way to execute this as well as possible. Um, we're interested in, you know, obviously, a review and comments on our field study proposal. Uh, specifically, what's the best way to conduct this curve refinement field test? Um, this is an allowance for DWP and the SIP, some of the interests we're suing. What's the best way to do that? How, how, can we, how can we do that in a way that's going to provide information that will be applicable and can, we can use with confidence to adjust that curve refine, or that uh, shallow foot control efficiency curve. And then recommendations related on the method of control efficiency calculations. And if low fluxes are observed in the untreated area, how to deal with those? Is there a de minimis level that we filter? Uh, is there another way to perhaps use a reference value to determine control efficiency? Um, how can that best be done? And then <clears throat> kind of related to that is if soil moisture dust control, if soil moisture does prove to be a important factor in dust control in these shallow flood areas, you know, what's the best way to implement that in the future? Um, how could that be monitored? How could that be tracked? Uh, is that something that can be implemented on a field scale? And then suggestions that I just talked about for providing that uninterrupted estimate between square images of ground conditions. Uh, both for saturated wetness cover and soil moisture profile. So I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have one more presentation in this group before uh, questions and break, and that is from Dr. Uh, Holder again, and it is the district recommendations for the panel. 
All right, well, you'll be very glad to hear that I only have just a few slides, so it won't take very long. Um, in our approach to um, alternate death control measure development for your consideration is uh, quite a bit different than uh, what was presented by uh, Evan and John. So basically, I wanted to sort of refocus things back on the purpose of the panel uh, as in the 2014 stipulated judgment and then the initial tasks that you're uh, supposed to be addressing. So um, as you can see on the slide there, the purpose of the panel is for the OSAP to evaluate and assess and provide ongoing advice on the reduction of airborne dust in the Owens Valley, um, review scientific and technical issues related to the research development and implementation of waterless and low water use backums and other approaches to reduce dust in the Owens Valley. And specifically in the stipulated judgment, it actually wrote out the initial task, so that's what you're working on now. And um, we've already talked about it quite a bit, but it's to evaluate the effectiveness of alternate dust control methods. Um, and we've changed, we um, are pretty quite a bit different. And instead of actually having specific dust control measures that we're interested in having you, you evaluate, we've kind of um, divided it into three different main categories and how they could be um, implemented on the lake. Um, so they're, they're listed over on the right side of the slide. So the first one would be for use in temporary dust control measure areas. Um, and I've got some examples coming up here. Also for control measure implementation in environmentally sensitive areas where you don't need to have backup. Um, so maybe some kind of non-backup measure that could be used that would be something that could be implemented in those areas that would be um, considerate of the resources there, there and pr their protection. And then also in off-lake areas, so off of Owens Lake Bend. So for the temporary dust control measures, I've divided that up into sort of two main categories. One would be sources that are located within the total dust control area that is uh, has been ordered for dust control on Owens Lake. Uh, an example might be a transition area where they're trying to transition from one backup measure to another backup measure. So there's pretty strict requirements there. They're written into the SIP and the board order and the, um, all the laws that are applicable that only allow um, a certain amount of area to be transitioned um, at any one time. Um, and then there's also areas that um, might be um, becoming emissive due to breakdowns and variances that might be um, allowed by our hearing board. So you might need a temporary dust control measure in some of those areas, like the jet crash that happened back in you know, 2009 or whenever it was. Um, there's also been breakdowns in the pipeline and some of the turnouts that have had large areas, large areas dry out and become emissive and cause violations that might um, you know, be suitable for a temporary dust control measure while the repairs are being done. But then also there's areas that might need additional control within the dust control area. So like in uh, managed veg grow out areas where you're not getting the control that you're, or the cover that you need within an area, um, this would allow um, maybe additional grill out time if you would if you could implement a temporary dust control measure in some of those areas. Um, and then sources outside of the total dust control area on the lake bed might be areas that have opened up but have not been ordered yet. So some of the areas that Phil was showing in the map that showed sort of the all the red squiggly lines that showed all the areas that have been observed to be emissive. If some of those areas actually get um, you know, go through the whole process of the dust ID model and then they're determined to cause violations at the shoreline. Um, you know, it could potentially be ordered, but if we can implement controls in those areas or identify them before it went through that whole process, then you could be able to implement something either on a temporary basis if they're infrequent sources or on a, um, you know, a less than backup level because they hadn't been ordered yet. Um, and then also the off-lake sources with the areas outside of the uh, total dust control area. Um, if you look at the other two categories, we've got control measures for environmentally sensitive areas. Um, those are becoming much more prominent and more important on the lake over the course of time as dust control has been implemented. 
on the lake bed, and they're um, something that we're very concerned about. So there's quite a bit of area now that has been avoided to protect the resources. And some of those areas may ultimately have to have controls at some level implemented within them. And some sort of alternate dust control measure could be appropriate for some of those sensitive areas, either for protection of cultural resources or um, paleontological resources or some kind of habitat value or something like that. Um, and then there's also, you know, potentially environmentally sensitive areas that would be located within future dust control. Or maybe you could plan ahead of time instead of avoiding them and then try to develop a measure. If you already have some kind of measure available, that you could implement those within the, the dust control order rather than having to go through the whole process that we're going through now. And um, as we've said before, there are significant sources of dust above the shoreline, the regulatory shoreline. Um, and some of those are going to have to be addressed at some point. We're currently doing the dust control project in the Keeler Dunes, but there are some other off-lake sources uh, that may have to have dust controls implemented in them, and some kind of alternate dust control measure would be appropriate. Can I ask you a clarifying question? What do you mean by above in that case? Uh, um, above an elevation, higher in elevation. Yes. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. And that's the end of my presentation. <laughs> I think I was less than my five minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Holder. Uh, I'm going to propose uh, the agenda says we take a break and then we come back for questions. And so I'm going to suggest that we go to questions right now and then have a uh, hard target of four o'clock for starting up our uh, final group of presentations so that we don't lose our presenters or cause them to deal with even heavier LA traffic as they make their way to wherever they're going next. Uh, so um, so the, in that way, the panel can control how long a break they have uh, by the number of questions the panel asks. Uh, so I will, with that, uh, open it up for questions. And uh, Dr. Venkatram. Uh, they call me Venky. Thank you, yes. Yeah, very interesting presentation from uh, Dr. Burgess. Um, uh, I had, uh, had uh, noticed that shrubs were uh, being used now. Are they being used right now as a means of control? Um, Switch on bottom. Because somebody had mentioned the fact that they die very quickly because as soon as the roots reach uh, the saline, that was that was for trees. Trees, okay. Okay. Yeah. So they, yeah, they don't require much water. Um, no, the uh, specific those species are pretty, uh, a lot of the species that have been tested are phreatophytes, and they have pretty deep root systems, a lot deeper than. So the why not consider fences or something uh, that that doesn't require water to achieve what you want to achieve with shrubs? Um, I I can't speak to why I have not had experience in, in the issues that. That uh, Sam fences or the issues that have been faced with Sam fences. Anyone back there? Maybe Jaime? Uh, Moton Row was kind of was a sand fence project, and, and, and the fence project that was was limited to a small BTA as far as, and that was a permanent sand fence installation for a lot of regulatory issues with environmental impacts, potentially to migrating birds and other types of vegetation. Um, but yeah, it's outside of I, I don't I don't know if the district has an issue with it, but there might be issues with uh, fish and wildlife or the landowner that don't doesn't believe that sand fencing is uh, enhances public trust or 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 uh, you know the the uh, what's the word I'm looking for habitat value out there. The closest thing to shrubs would be the porous roughness elements, and Dr. Holder can talk about that. Well, there are, there are the, the shrubs in the Keeler Dunes, which is an area that's off the lake bed, and we're using shrubs, so that is recognized as a, an appropriate control mechanism. Um, there are also shrubs that are in the 42 species that are approved for fence veg. Um, there's quite a few shrubs in there. Uh, in terms of the sand fences, I think, I think the main constraint there is that in terms of to get the control efficiency level, you would need quite a maze of sand fences on the lake bed and it hasn't been supported by the landowner at this point. 
Okay, uh, I'll note that we uh, have probably questions that will take us till four, uh, <laughs> negating the committee's break. So I would encourage you then, if you need a biological break, please go ahead and take it at your convenience. Uh, next is Greg. Um, I'm, I'm uh, John, I'm really glad that you talked about the uh, temporal and spatial resolution questions with uh, imagery. Because um, it's, I think that explains probably a lot of, of the frustration that Anne talked about specifically in terms of you see one thing in the data, but your field crews are seeing another. Um, so really, this is a question about what what exists in the documents that exist. I mean, you said there's the possibility to change uh, how you might do new factums. But does the possibility exist to, for the district to advise how you evaluate the sector? In other words, how much flexibility does the, um, does the district have to change its monitoring? Um, flexibility exists in the regulatory documents to change how the performance criteria are evaluated. Um, depending on the criteria, some of those procedures are m more specific in the regulatory documents, uh, but all of them reference authority to the air pollution control officer to approve different methods of evaluation. And in general, the district is always open to better and simpler ways to evaluate the performance criteria. Need drones with squirt cameras on them. Drones at relatively high altitude. You can do it every week. Do it every day. About the drone <laughs> flights at high elevation? Yeah, I'll pass to Evan because he's done more work on that, but that's a great idea. <laughs> well, just as someone who's uh, uh, maybe to inject a little bit into that conversation, as someone who's tried to get permission to fly drones, particularly near military airspaces, is that a feasibility? Is that possible in the Owens Lake region? Uh, so, of China. Yeah, one point there. so uh, we, we have uh, worked with drones um, on Owens Lake. We have not implemented a SWIR sensor. Drone. Those, that is, at this point, there is no commercial option for mounting a SWIR sensor on a drone, so you have to engineer that yourself with basically a, a lab SWIR camera, which is totally totally doable. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The, this is this is Scott. I guess I'll, I'll let me just jump in. I'll, I'll take a little exception to that. That it that it is quite possible. It's done pretty routinely. My question there might be the times you might want to sample. It might be um, blowing like the bejesus, and and that's not a good yeah. time to fly drones. I'm afraid. So um, yeah, they work well on a nice sunny afternoon. Let's put it that way. Uh, yeah, you made one point. Um, the the military operations on the lake are a significant problem. They there are two um, two uh, military flight practice mines uh, straight over the lake, so they fly routinely under 200 feet, uh, fast enough to scare you a lot. Um, <laughs> so, and we and that, and that has caused issues. It doesn't mean that you can't doesn't mean that you can't operate, but it, it is an issue to consider. The wind is also is also a problem, and there have been other um, reasons why uh, the city hasn't pursued uh, drones as a is that is something that that DWP is you know that we're exploring. So yeah. For team, or do we have another? Yeah. Please. Uh, the district has utilized SWIR on fixed wing aircraft um, during times when Landsat imagery has been unavailable for long periods of time. There's over 30 square miles of shallow flooding back on that's implemented, so it is for the scaling issue. Utilizing. Yeah, I think Evan, you gave a very elegant talk. But have you considered, in, you've done a great detail to estimate the sand flux or the dust flux. <clears throat> have you looked at that as a function of particle size? Which then I think I would just jump to John in terms of the low emission rates. Efficiencies, if you use a number count based efficiency calculation, you would get much more accurate results. So, mm -hmm. that goes back to your yeah. theory 
is the efficiency of function of particle size and then back out the field. Um, no, we have not. We have not looked into that at all. And I mean, the, the the tricky thing with that is that the particle size distributions within the soils on the lake change um, depending yeah. where you are on the lake. So it, it's, it's and uh, and that is certainly for a research estimation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I haven't I haven't looked into like specific mass flux equations you could use for different particle. Uh, particle size distributions and whatnot. So yeah, that'd be really great to get some more thoughts on. And they're good copying devices as well as do instead of your hand flexing. Yeah, so the, the sensors that we have back there, they they are they are very much imperfect um, instruments and and, um, and trying to get real time uh, sand flux observations mm -hmm. with, with an actual mass flux estimate in real time is still a very very real challenge. Um, like problems. Sure. Thank you, Bob. Actually, um, you mentioned, uh, John, about combining SAR data and sensor data. And um, one thing I would say is, and, and, I, and I wasn't 100% sure if you're considering this, but maybe something to consider is you can measure these things as much as you want, but unless you have a good number on evaporation and evapotranspiration and temperature, then your model will never be able to capture what is happening on the ground. And the second thing I, I'm not I'm not sure can answer that is what measures are put in place to deal with evaporation and evapotranspiration when you are uh, doing the shallow flooding because uh, temperature can be quite high and there's a lot of evaporation. I mean I, I wonder how much benefit you're getting and then. One, one other question, and this can sort of be answered together, is um, is there any interest or effort or possibility of turning these shallow flooding areas to brine ponds gradually by introducing um, different water quality? Well, I can address, uh, maybe partly address your evaporation question. Um, Jennifer, I think Jennifer Wong is no longer here. She would probably be the best person to answer that. But um, LADWP operations staff on the lake is in charge of basically maintaining compliance in the shallow flood areas. So they operate those areas um, kind of based on their experience and, and uh, the procedures they have. So they'll basically change the water application based on climate conditions as they observe them. Uh, like I said, Jennifer could probably speak better if there's a formal way they do that, but as far as I know, um, a lot of it is experience-based. And where is this water going? Do we need to up the water in this area a little bit more? We're a little dry. You know, let's put some more water on there now. So I think it's very much, at the moment, um, more of an art than a science. So, so just, just, to, just to sort of share some of my thoughts on your answer is that if you are looking to find a model mm -hmm. that would give you some way of predicting producing where everything is going and how you can uh, you know, not cross the boundaries you don't want to cross by like going below 75% or not, if you don't have the right numbers on evaporation and evaporation and global transpiration and, um, and temperature, then it's going to be very, very difficult to do that just by having, um, and, and I'm hoping you're, you're not thinking, okay, we will have all the data sets, we'll do some machine learning, and okay, if someone comes in, we'll predict what's going to come out. Because for these natural processes, we can just do so much um, machine learning. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, if you don't have the right numbers on the natural process, like the you know climate numbers or you know, things that really really or actually wind speed or any of that is very very difficult to do a prediction just based on having the historical data on how long the weather is going to last and what percentage are you getting based on that just because you're combining SAR and sensors <clears throat> you're not going to get there right uh, just to clarify are you talking about making a prediction for future wetness based on sensor so My understanding was that you you'd be very interested to, to build a model based on the data that you have from SAR, 
and uh, sensors to to help you to understand the fluctuation, right? Wasn't that what you were looking for? Uh, well, that might be something we work towards in the future, but as of now, I think um, our intent is more to be able to estimate the ground conditions at a moment, not where they're going to go in the even, future. Even if you want to estimate, mm -hmm. even you, if you just want to estimate, just simulate and be able to estimate and you know, calibrate your models and be able to estimate at any given time. Mm -hmm. If you don't have those numbers, you'll constantly overwhelm it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, we'll definitely be recording those. I mean, and, and meteorological I'm, data will be there, so. There are some studies looking at, and not, not at all next, but there are some studies looking at, for example, people who have grass in their house. Mm. And they water and water and water. It doesn't matter how much you water. If it's a, you, you're in a severe drought, the, it just cannot maintain the vigor of the vegetation. And not that it's just, it's very relevant to what you're talking about here, but it's like a different kind of a study. Mm. So my point is, if you don't have the estimate looking to sort of those climatic numbers, it's going to be very difficult to have a right estimate. Okay, well, thank you. That's on to our final two questions. We have it from uh, first from Scott Van Pelt in the room and then Scott on the line. Yeah, I just want to make a comment to you, John. Trying to measure soil moisture and how it affects emissivity or the erodibility of the surface, you're not going to do it with any of the instruments that you're planning on using. This is a millimeter scale problem with soil moisture. And, and that capillary break occurs less than two centimeters in the surface. I've seen it rain like gangbusters in the morning, water standing in the furrows, and sand blowing over the tops of the beds, and thus being emitted by 11 o'clock in the morning. So probably the only way that you're going to be able to get a good estimate of that surface water content is by infrared thermometry of the surface and taking a look at, at the evaporation state. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, final question for this session from Scott on the line. Yeah, thanks. I'll, I'll stick on the soil moisture and the evaporation question uh, a little bit. Just thinking about this, I recognize that, that, that the, 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 the interest is to reduce the amount of water being used, but, but I would look carefully uh, at, at uh, A, how much efficiency you expect to gain before too much is done because it's very costly concept, um, but also the fact that once you start irrigating in a patchy network like that, you do tend to, if you're familiar with the complementary or Boucher's hypothesis, um, you do, and this is, goes back to some of the things that I've already heard on the phone, but uh, these are things that can actually enhance evaporation because you essentially have wet islands surrounded by dry islands. So, so in the long run, you may end up evaporating more water um, than you had originally done with a fully wetted surface. Um, that is far cooler, as as was just pointed out. So just be, this is a complex. This is not an easy uh, uh, problem, and, and there's some pretty severe complexities about the scale at which you you uh, you wet the ground. So um, it's not easy, and it's not straightforward necessarily that you will significantly decrease evaporation. And I guess the question will be, how much evaporation do you expect to to reduce? That's a that's an important question to go into this this those kinds of studies with. What do you expect to see? Okay, so thank you for that comment. Um, and I thank all the speakers for uh, their presentations this afternoon.